Title of my talk, Syntax Macros, Case Study and Extending Clang. Now, the, um, the reason this, 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 this started was really, well, actually, there were multiple reasons. So basically going to be talking on a kind of like project that I've been working on on the side a little bit. I'm going to go into the motivation uh, in, a, in, a, in a second. Um, just a quick show of hands, perhaps. I mean, who has experience with uh, hacking on Clang? There's quite a few hands. Um, who's ever sort of like used Clang to extend uh, the language by a new feature, like say an attribute or a uh, or a keyword or something like that? Okay, also a few hands, so, but not too many, fortunately. So I should probably start with a disclaimer. I mean, I wouldn't deem myself an expert in Clang. Um, I certainly have not contributed anything upstream to Clang, but um, in the kind of work we do. Um, when you sort of like start a research project and you want to look at um, want to look at what features might be good to have in the language, what features might uh, work well with certain uh, programming paradigms, and how to map them down to architecture, um, you're often faced with uh, the problem of well, needing some way, shape, or form of telling the language, telling the compiler that you want to use this new feature. So you have to go away and implement it, and uh, so as we just heard in the previous talk, for example, uh, what if you need to tell the compiler that your function pointers live in different spaces? Right. And that is something that comes up a lot in the work that we do. And let me just spend a few moments uh, introducing ourselves. So um, our research group is uh, the uh, well, it's based around the chair for compiler construction. So our boss, Geronimo, where is he? There he is. Uh, Geronimo uh, Castrillo, like, has experience in uh, uh, basically code generation for, for multi-core SOCs. He's worked a lot on data flow models and how you sort of like map tasks uh, across the uh, the cores uh, uh, that you may have in a in, in a multi-core chip. Um, um, so programming models, programming paradigms being really the uh, the kind of link to what I'll be talking about uh, today. And then co-worker of mine, another postdoc in, uh, in our team, Sven Carroll. I mean, he's really a software engineering person. He's done research on software engineering, specifically software composition. Um, he's uh, got quite a bit of experience um, uh, working with and implementing uh, domain-specific languages. And so at some point, we sort of like got into talking um, about language extensions and all of that. And um, so Sven is really like a Java person. I mean, when we sort of like have occasionally looked at uh, Clang or LVM source code together, then I feel like he always gets a bit scared um, by the sort of like heavy use of sort of like C++ features, templates, and all of that. I mean, I must admit, I probably get a bit scared sometimes myself. And I certainly get scared if I were to look at like a large-scale Java project. I mean, I've never written a single line of Java in my life. So uh, we're quite complement uh, complementary in that way. Um, but so... One thing I'm told is really like easy to do in Java is actually extend the language. And there are like tools and frameworks and libraries you can use to include new language features. And um, we thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if you could do something like that in C uh, or C++? Because that way you would basically give access to that kind of tool to like a whole other kind of quite large community. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is how I, at some point, started thinking about, well, I mean, well, what does it actually take to extend Clang? And, uh, um, you yep, know, somehow I wound up with this kind of, like, after a couple of weeks of work thinking and, 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 and like, a one week of relatively intense work and uh, sort of, like, a bit more relaxed work on, on, on other days, I ended up with this sort of, like, uh, prototype uh, toy implementation of syntax macros that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and, but th the point here is is really that I don't want to, tell you to sort of like use syntax and macros and how great they are. I've really done no research on the um, sort of like the theory behind them. For me, they're just a toy model that sort of like let me study or let me analyze what it actually takes to, to, to extend Clang by new language features. And um, the main purpose of this talk is really to sort of like see if anyone is excited by this, if anyone is interested in this, if people have done this. And if people have done this and have found that it's not worthwhile doing, it's not worthwhile looking into extending Clang because it's just impossible, I'd be very happy uh, if people could tell me that I should like stop this right now. <laughs> okay. 
Right. Yeah. So there are a few more people in our group. So if you're interested, uh, go to our website, uh, find out what we do and who we are. Okay. So introduction to uh, syntax macros. There's a quote from a 1993 paper, um, which I'm going to give you the reference for on a later slide. Macros are the world's second oldest programming language. Younger only, I suppose, than uh, assembly. And that's, in fact, how uh, macros, I guess, first came about, that instead of like writing the same assembly code over and over again, um, you wanted to have a macro that would maybe like take an operand as an argument and then expand into like a small assembly listing. So macros are really a, a productivity tool. And we, uh, we all, I suppose, have a bit of a love and hate relationship with uh, preprocessor macros. Um, I mean, they're very widely used, certainly in, uh, in some projects. Um, and since they do textual replacement only before the compiler actually gets started, um, diagnostics and error message used to be rather poor, uh, but I think that's been improving a lot over, uh, over the last couple of years, um, especially for Clang as well. Um, right, so syntax macros. So rather than doing this textual replacement, what I want to do with syntax macros is basically want to be able to define um, sort of like sub ASTs that I then want to paste in in other places in the source code where I need them. Um, again, the motivation being um, sort of like getting rid of like boilerplate code and doing this at the AST level basically opens up the avenue for, uh, for the compiler doing sort of some kind of like type checking and emitting diagnostics in case you've done something wrong. Um, so how does this work? So the preprocessor macro is a incredibly helpful macro here. Um, the preprocessor macro, you basically just say, well, this piece of text should be replaced by this. Right. Okay. Whereas in the syntax macro, really, this piece of text is replaced by a whole um, subtree of the uh, AST. Um, and one of the things I should say straight away, so every node in here is an expression. And expressions have a type, as in like they have a type in the language. So there's a, uh, let's say like integers or integer pointers. Um, but when I talk about types in this talk, I will often mean types in the context of the AST, i.e. node types of the AST. So if it gets too confusing, please, um, please do uh, ask me to clarify. So yeah, a syntax macro will basically paste all this into the, uh, into the AST rather than give this to, to the compiler at an earlier stage and let the compiler um, sort of like reparse this every time it sees it. Okay, and again, this should help with uh, uh, correctness checks and uh, reduce uh, reduce sort of like unintended behavior that can sometimes happen when you do the uh, preprocessor replacement. Okay, so what does uh, the implementation look like? I mean, again, this is a prototype implementation. It's a toy model. Um, I'm not gonna try to sell this to anyone so it's not designed to be user friendly, it's designed to be easily implemented, right, without requiring too many checks. So this is how I define a syntax macro. And let me pick this apart for you a little bit. So a lot like uh, every C function, it starts with a header or a signature, and uh, it has a body. Right, now, uh, I have also, for this implementation, uh, profusely abused this dollar sign, it's called like the cache token in the Lexer, um, and introduced a few variations of that. So there's now a, a double dash and a triple, sorry, double cache and a triple cache token. Um, and the double cache basically uh, acts as, as a hedge to tell the parser, well, you're about to see a macro definition, or at least what you're about to see should be a macro definition. If it's not, tell me what's wrong with it. Um, then as for functions as well, you kind of like, instead of like a return type as you would have for functions, you specify the type for the uh, um, the macro, i.e., the root node in this sub AST that you're gonna that you're gonna construct. Um, give the macro has a name, and the macro has parameters. And again, this cache token appears as a parameter separator. You can't use a comma here because the comma appears as uh, can appear as part of a valid expression. So if you use a comma here, um, the uh, the parser might not realize that this uh, uh, this token is actually ending. It might think that the expression runs on, uh, but that's just a small subtlety. The other thing you need 
you need to specify what types, as in like what AST node types your parameters uh, can be. And the subtlety here is everything that's an expression also has a type in the language. So you have to provide the type in the language as well. Ultimately, these are things that can be inferred and that probably should be inferred. Um, but for this sort of like toy model, it's, uh, it's not done yet. The one thing that is inferred, however, if the, uh, the body is passed and the, uh, how that happens, I'm going to tell you uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, at that point, when it, the body has been passed, um, uh, the parser or rather the type checker can work out what, uh, what its type is and it'll then sort of like infer the language type of the, uh, the macro. Okay, and this is the macro separator I talked about. And again, we also use these triple uh, cache signs, or we only use the triple cache signs actually as um, hedges for parameters, parameter instantiation. So when the parser comes across this, it knows that it should, uh, it should look for parameter var that's been defined uh, in the macro header and instantiate uh, and basically paste whatever, um, when the macro is called, it should paste whatever um, argument has been passed in uh, in this place in the body. Okay. So what does this look like? I can now use these macros to basically inst instantiate parts of the AST. And this is what comes out of the macro. Um, the thing in this uh, dashed box. Uh, the one point that's worthwhile noting here is that 41 is indeed an integer literal. So we, on the previous slide, we defined this macro to take an integer literal as a second argument. If I put an X in here as well, uh, the macro parser would have complained and said that, well, x is an integer literal, uh, x is an expression, should have been an integer literal, not every expression is an integer literal, therefore, this is an error. Um, so these are the kind of things you can do here. Um, okay, now again, the syntax macros are just uh, a sort of like an example, um, and so one could c come up with this like rather big goal and say, well, use syntax macros instead of preprocessor macros everywhere. I mean, the implementation that I've presented here is not quite ready for that. Um, um, but I promised you at the start that I would give you this reference here. And what they present in their paper um, is actually what they call programmable syntax macro. So you can actually um, instantiate parts of the AST based on conditions. You can have sort of like for loops for syntax macros and all of that. So they've really, uh, uh, they've really implemented like a relatively complete uh, system, or at least so it's presented. Um, what I've done here is really only something that can that lets you basically define and pick up certain parts of the AST and paste them into the code later. Again, like as a as a sort of like a case study. Um, yeah. So one of the use cases I haven't talked about is, um, and or at least this was motivation for doing this. I mean, maybe this can be useful to help language designers or people who are who work on language standards to. Uh, to sort of like prototype items that are usually referred to as a syntactic sugar, right? I mean, maybe you can just define something as a macro in the first instance, and if you see it's useful, then uh, then maybe you want to think about whether sort of like some more rigid or more um, sort of like native language feature should be defined that can provide that functionality. Um, any other suggestions you might have, please do do tell me. I, you know, again, if this if this get some traction out of, or if this project gets some traction out of this presentation, uh, I'd, be, I'd be more than happy, of course. Okay, so now, this was kind of like the first half of the talk, I've sort of like told you what I've, what I've implemented, what I've done, what the case study is, and I want to talk a little bit about what you have to do uh, in Clang to make this work, and sort of like point out where the, uh, where sort of like the difficulties are. Um, okay, so this was our example from a couple of slides ago. Um, Basically, to make this work, we replace the parser by our own macro parser. And as I've already said, this double cache acts as a, as a hedge. When the macro parser comes across this, it knows that it has to deal with, as has to process a macro. If it doesn't see this, see this um, it just defers to the old parser class. So this naturally calls for what kind of implementation of macro parser? Anyone? Exactly, yeah. Um, um, okay, yeah, so there's a parser, and uh, we want to make this polymorphic, um, or rather, we wanna, first of all, we have to make parser virtual. Then we derive the macro parser class, which is actually very thin. It only overrides a couple of methods. Um, but for this to work, for example, at, uh, at a place where statements can occur, um, 
you would want to override the uh, path statement or declaration class. Um, and yeah, so as we said, very natural use polymorphism, um, except this really isn't in Clang, right? I mean, in Clang, the um, the parser class and, and, and other classes that are uh, that sort of like implement the front end are not polymorphic, they're not virtual. Um, right, when we instantiate macros, again, this was the example from a couple of slides ago, um, the macro parser will look out for, uh, for this cache token, and if it's easy, it uh, will pass the macro parameters, um, again, separated by a cache token, if this hedge is not picked up, then uh, it'll just defer to the to the conventional parser. Again, same strategy as before, um, except, and this is actually another subtlety, um, so if we want this to work, this macro exp expansion wherever an expression can occur, you want to overload the parse expression method. Now, the problem with parsing expressions is that the way they're parsed is you first parse an expression, then you go on to parse the left-hand side, at some point you come across an operator, then you pass the right-hand side, and then you kind of like loop around and like pass more and more right-hand sides as you see them. Um, so when you do this, this does not work the way you would expect. I mean, basically to make this work the way you would expect it, you can sort of like nest expressions and have macros appear in nested expressions. Um, you basically have to guide the parser into calling the parse expression function. And the, to do this is basically, uh, to do this, you basically have to uh, put every sub-expression in parentheses because only that will cause the parser to kind of like go back to a uh, parse expression and not use the uh, parser right-hand side uh, method. So a few subtleties one encounters. Um, again, it's very natural to, to, to use polymorphism here. Um, and finally, um, basically, now we've passed the macro definition, or the macro instantiation rather, but we need to instantiate an AST. Now, the way ASTs are first constructed in Clang is that the parser basically parses a certain sequence of tokens, and when it's decided that it's seen a statement or something, it parses that onto uh, to the SEMA module. The SEMA does the type checking and then constructs the, uh, the AST that corresponds to that, uh, to that, uh, uh, to that sequence of tokens. Um, now, we do the same thing here. Um, we basically let the SEMA module construct the... Uh, uh, the sub -A AST for the macro body, and then it basically writes away the macro name together with the macro body in like a lookup table. And when the parser wants to instantiate a macro, it tells Sema, well, please give me the AST for this. Um, and that's what happens when you call act on, act on macro. Um, the difference here is you don't really need polymorphism here because the only place from which you will ever be calling the macro Sema class is from the macro parser, and that knows that it wants the macro semi class, right? Um, there's a further subtlety to do with like uh, parsing macros and like storing away sub ASTs uh, in the semi module. Uh, when you parse an a when you parse a macro definition, um, you kind of have to introduce placeholders for the uh, parameters because you don't know what they are. They could be arbitrarily large ASTs so long as the root node has the right type. Um, so the way this has been implemented is basically created a placeholder node for expressions and a placeholder node for statements in the AST. Um, and again, quick show of hands, who's ever tried to extend Clang by a uh, new AST node? No one, no one? Okay, well, it's not, it's not rocket science. Um, it's just quite tedious. Um, I mean, Clang actually lets you, uh, helps you out a bit with uh, um, so like the, the, there's a bit of like table gen support that automatically generates code that you need for that. But then what also happens as a, as a result of the automatically generated code, um, you, uh, uh, you end up with, uh, uh, with sort of like lots of compiler errors for, for example, cases in switch statement that are, haven't been covered, right? So you have to actually put in a lot of boilerplate code to shut up those compiler errors. Um, right. There are a few subtle problems with uh, the semantics. I mean, so far I've talked about syntax macros, but actually the interesting thing about this implementation is also because you keep calling back into the SEMA module, you can make a bit, bit of semantics work as well. Um, now that can be, a, now that can be a, a, a feature or it can actually be a, a, a burden that you may have to deal with. Like for example, if you want to uh, have a macro for return statements, 
then most of the time, or actually all the time when you implement this at, uh, at uh, or when you define this at uh, global scope, it will not work because when you ask the SEMA module to give you the, uh, the AST for this statement, it'll say, well, hang on, I don't have a function scope. Um, so, uh, so I'm just going to give you back an empty AST. Right? And in that case, all the macro parser can do really is to say, oh, well, I've been given an empty uh, AST. Something is wrong, so I bail. So that's not the kind of diagnostics that you would expect. You know, I was trying to make a point earlier how the diagnostics can be improved by using this over, for example, preprocessor macros. Um, yeah, so you got to do something. I mean, this can, of course, be, be, be handled suitably if you sort of like ask for, uh, ask for sort of like more explicit error messages. Um, a more subtle problem is to do with the scope of variable names, right? So if you define this anywhere, I mean, what is X, right? I mean, X can be bound to, I mean, well, usually when you see this and you just let the, let the SEMA module run on this, X will end up being bound to whatever X is in scope. Um, now, the point is, when you do this for, uh, for these syntax macros, X will end up having some scope um, that maybe at the time when you instantiate the macro is not around any longer. So in effect, when you uh, then so like instantiate the macro, there may, there may not be any memory allocated to back up X. So you most likely run into a tech fault. Um, problem with this is of course, when this is not uh, uh, not highlighted, you know, by an error message, then you know you're, you're seeing errors where you wouldn't expect one. Uh, another problem, and this is really something that really needs to be addressed if you want to make this, or if, if 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 I wanted to make this into a kind of really usable implementation, is what if X is not in scope at all? I mean, in this case, what this what you might want this to mean is that when you instantiate this macro, at that point, should you check what the binding is for X? Um, and, and, and that's the binding you want. At least that's sort of like a well-defined, um, that would be a well-defined way of making this work. Um, I mean, currently this, this does not work because SEMA sort of like runs with the, uh, the scope that is given from the parser. Uh, but I'll say a few more words about that on the next slide. Okay, so my uh, software engineering or DSL expert of choice, namely the person that sits next to me at work, tells me uh, that he likes to call this the open scope problem. So what are suitable definitions for, uh, what are suitable scopes for, uh, for sort of like free or unbound variable names and macro definitions? Okay. So again, I said at the start that um, uh, I wanted to present to you this implementation of uh, syntax macros, but with a strong focus on like how easy or how difficult it was to implement that, uh, sort of like with a, with a look toward how difficult would it be to implement on top of Clang some of the uh, some of the sort of like functionality that is provided by these language extensions or DSL design frameworks that, for example, Java sort of like come, well doesn't come with, but that are available uh, in Java. Um, so, and here sort of like a quick a quick sort of like grid of problems or needs that I, I think have been identified um, and uh, how hard it would be to uh, to fix them. So, I said polymorphism in the parser be really useful for this kind of uh, this kind of language extension, and that works, of course, because I have these these, these hedges, right? So really, what I want to do, I kind of like need a parser that sort of like parses on top of uh, the C++ parser. So that's what can relatively easily be implemented using uh, polymorphism. Um, the uh, uh, the one problem with that, of course, is um, making parser virtual uh, might mean that uh, the performance of Clang i.e. compilation times that users will see might go down because that introducing virtual classes uh, well, introduces this extra overhead of pot or potential extra overhead due to uh, indirect calls. Um, another use case I haven't talked about is polymorphism of code gen. Uh, I mean, I can think of at least one example where this would help with uh, uh, implementing certain compiler flags and I mean, maybe other people can as well. So you'd basically, you'd basically use code gen, code gen methods as is but because of the polymorphism, you would overload methods that kind of that then kind of like have code that wrap around the existing methods to just uh, tweak the code generation a little bit depending on the new compiler flags that you want to implement. Uh, briefly mentioned that introducing new AST nodes is a bit 
is a bit uh, tedious. I mean, there is potentially a solution for this, namely, you could, you could add sort of like generic subclasses of things that are already uh, modeled by the, the sort of like the type structure or the class structure that models the AST, um, for which all the boilerplate and all the automatically generated code is already in place, and then users that want to use Clang for, for uh, sort of like this kind of experimental work that I've presented here, um, they could then sort of like just overload these these sort of like generic subclasses. Sorry, not overload. They could use these and derive, if if necessary, from these uh, uh, generic subclasses to uh, um, to sort of like very quickly uh, implement uh, uh, implement their sort of like experimental features without having to sort of like shut up all the uh, compiler warnings or write the boilerplate code that's required for that. Okay, and now the really interesting stuff is. Um, and that's what is needed to actually make sort of like full DSLs or uh, full extensions, full DSL implementations available on top of Clang. And that is actually what would bring us closer to uh, this kind of, uh, well, extensibility framework that I mentioned, um, is when you can sort of like exercise a bit more control over SEMA from, say, the parser. Um, now, the parser, for example, communicates with SEMA by the scope class. I mean, the parser enters and exits scope, and SEMA module will populate scope and use scope for type checking. Um, now, that may already be good enough, um, but as you can see from this blank here, I've kind of left this open because I'm not sure. I haven't really looked into this yet. Um, and maybe people can come up with suggestions for things to fill in here. Uh, and lastly, more generally, I mean, it's kind of... Uh, so like more or less the same issue, but when you put the open context problem here, it sounds a bit more general. And uh, I mean, one way of solving this, and that would of course also take care of the previous issue in the, in, in the second to last line is like separate parser from SEMA fully. Now, I'm pretty sure no one would want to do this, not on the existing code base, and, and maintainers obviously wouldn't be happy to do this, but um, correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I'm aware, this is, what, this is how Swift actually does its uh, parsing and type checking. So it first constructs a parse tree, uh, which is relatively compact, and it then hands, then, hands, hands it off to the SEMA module, and that constructs like a full-fledged AST that is type-checked and is annotated. And it, this sort of like annotator tree that SEMA comes up with is really blown up compared to the small parse tree we had before. Um, yeah, so I think doing this would be hard. And this may be the kind of thing that people should tell me not to attempt if they... Uh, Right, again, so this is this gap, which I would like to uh, sort of like fill in, maybe with your help. Um, um, just to summarize what I just, just said, I mean, how do we uh, best support and sort of like semantics for an embedded DSL um, with a given sort of like structure, with a given interaction between parser and SEMA. And um, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the goal that this was kind of like a first step to um, is maybe have some kind of like clean, potentially incomplete interface that lets you add new language features uh, to C, to plus plus on top of Clang relatively easily without having to write a lot of uh, boilerplate code without digging into the nitty gritty of Clang too, uh, too, uh, too deeply. And that's it. Sources are available. Uh, be very happy to receive feedback. I have people uh, contribute or play around with stuff if things are interesting. Thank you.